Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 13010, Evidence and Proof. We're into week three. This week we're dealing with methods of proof and uh, the material in the study guide is based on, in part, chapter two of your text and in part, chapter three of your text. So we have a couple online. Thank you for joining us once again. Uh, for those that might be looking at a recorded session of this um, tutorial, please consider joining us live so that we can engage in some further discussions. Also, just a reminder that we have the um, assessment pieces online. The second assessment I changed a couple of weeks ago to give you a choice of movies um, that you could view and provide answers to the tutorial questions. So um, you have a choice there. The first assessment um, is uh, due fairly soon. And at this stage, as I recall, I've only got a listing for two or maybe three groups. So if you haven't found a partner yet, please do so as soon as possible. Um, you can start your preparation without having found a partner. Um, this is not a group exercise. It's an individual exercise. The idea of pairing you up is simply so that you've got someone you can bounce off some ideas and you can work together in a sense. So I'm happy for you to discuss the assessment uh, even discuss your questions with each other and with the class generally. So my view of collaboration is broad and I will take collaboration as far as I can up to but not cross over into collusion. And uh, welcome Vivian for joining us this evening as well. So I'm glad we're getting a few more joining us now. Um, so the first assessment, please find someone if you haven't already, send me an email saying, look, I've teamed up with this person and make sure that you CC your partner in on that assessment. And I use the word partner loosely because it's not a group assessment in any way. But if you haven't uh, found a partner, start f forming your questions because you'll need to upload those questions in a single Word document on uh, Moodle in the usual manner. That is, um, uh, and then and book in a time with me for the actual live session. Second assessment, have a look at those movies or one of the two movies and uh, answer the question through Moodle in the usual manner. All right, so um, this week we're dealing with methods of proof and I guess what um, we're discussing when it comes to proof without new evidence is the methods by which a party who bears a burden of proof is able to adduce evidence on an issue at law um, because at law the point is already proved. So what does all that mean? Okay, so let's break it down in terms of different types of evidence. So presumptions, judicial notice, formal admissions and estoppel. I know that Anthony Maranac in his excellent series of formal lectures deals with these issues very well. So what is I mean, I'll just open it up. We've got a few in the group. Does anyone want to tell me what is a presumption and how does it operate in terms of evidence law? Any thoughts? Presumptions. All right, so a presumption is something where the court is entitled to draw a conclusion of fact based on something which is produced. So I guess we could put it this way. When party A provides certain facts in the absence of rebutting evidence from party B, the court is entitled to draw conclusions of fact. In other words, those conclusions are presumed to exist following proof of the basic fact. So if you, it's a little bit like prima facie, if you can adduce something, then a court is entitled to make a presumption beyond that, unless the other party produces evidence to rebut the presumption. So that's one type of factor of providing proof without necessarily providing new evidence beyond evidence of the basic facts. Number two, judicial notice. What's judicial notice? What does that mean? And how does it apply in evidence law? Any thoughts? I don't mean to put you on the spot. Is it where, um, 
is that where it's so common, a uh, common sense, the you know, definition of it, that it's presumed to be correct. Is that right? Very good. Yeah, very common. The word I like to use is so notorious. It's so notorious that a court may assume the fact to be true without the need for formal proof. I mean, who's the current Prime Minister of Australia? I mean, do we really need to prove that? Or can we just take that as a fact? Everybody knows that. So judicial notice is very broad. And if you're struggling to prove something, or there's a gap in your evidence, as an advocate, you might try to rely upon judicial notice as the way in which the court can assume something to be true, even though you have not proffered formal evidence to establish that fact. Does that make sense? Yes, Vivian. Okay, um, I was just going to say the same, same thing that Sam, Sam said. So. Very good. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Vivian. All right, formal admissions. What's a formal admission? What does that mean? So who would be admitting something and why? And why is that relevant to evidence law? Let's take a civil case. Party A brings a claim against party B. Party A has the burden of proof. Party A needs to establish everything that is necessary that has materially, material fact or bearing on the case. Does party A have to bring evidence to the court in relation to everything or can party B say, look, don't worry about that, I'll accept that, I'll admit that that's, that is true. I think it's the latter, isn't it? So if, for example, you have a dispute over a contract, then it may be that both parties acknowledge that there is a party, there is a contract. So instead of party A having to prove the existence of a contract, um, calling the witnesses to the signatures of the parties to verify that the party did in fact sign and signed in their presence, etc. The other party might say, Look, you don't have to call that witness. I acknowledge I'm prepared to admit formally that my client entered into a contract with your client and the contract can be admitted into evidence without having to formally prove it as part of your case. Does that make sense? So that's a formal admission. Now, the fourth one is estoppel. So what is an estoppel? It's a funny word, isn't it? Estoppel. Any thoughts? Estoppel. E-S-T-O-P-P-E-L. All right, so an estoppel is an assertion that the matter before the court has already been the subject of some sort of legal proceedings between the parties. And the other party is bound by the outcome of those proceedings and is stopped from raising it again. As part of the material, you may come across a thing called an Anshan estoppel. estoppel. It comes from a case in Victoria. What happened was that a claim was brought before a court. It was fully litigated. Later, Another party tried to introduce an argument based on the same facts and um, the Anshan case established that you've already had your bite at the cherry. You can't now come back and argue the same facts, arguing on a different legal basis. You should have done that at the start. Does that make sense? So the party that brought the second claim based on the first set of facts that were litigated in the first case is said to be a stopped from raising those facts and those issues in the second proceeding. So that's an anshan, a stopple. So an estoppel, you'll hear that widely used in law. It basically means you're not able to do something because of a course of conduct or because of a legal um, uh, presumption or a legal um, rule, and uh, you can't now raise that issue. Okay, so they're the four types of proof which are essentially proof without new evidence or minimal evidence might be a better way of putting it in the case of presumptions. All right, so let's just talk more about presumptions. So there might be presumptions of fact 
and there might be presumptions of law. So in a case, we have those elements of law and fact, don't we? In criminal proceedings before a jury, we know that the evidence brought by the Crown is subject to consideration by the jury as to fact and consideration by the court as to law. So there are some presumptions, presumptions of fact and presumptions of law. Now, it's probably a bit hard to argue that there are presumptions of fact. They're really, in, in essence, little more than circumstantial evidence. But a presumption of law does have greater legal significance. So presumptions of law are generally rebuttable, but they need not be rebuttable. Okay, we'll just go back to presumptions of fact briefly. Presumption of fact entitles, but doesn't force, it entitles a court to draw a further inference if it wishes to do so. I mean, a classic example of a presumption of fact, which is really circumstantial evidence, is this. An accused is seen running from the scene of a crime immediately after the crime was committed. That gives rise to a circumstantial inference, doesn't it? An inference that that person who was running from the scene may have been the perpetrator. Now, the jury can draw that inference if they wish, but they don't have to. It's really what we call a presumption of fact, but really it's only circumstantial evidence in that case. And you can see why it's not in any way binding on the arbiter of fact. So it's a presumption, perhaps, it's a bit loose, but it's a presumption of fact based uh, on the fact that, uh, sorry, on a circumstance where the jury, the arbiter of fact, can draw an inference based on something which is presented to it. Does that make sense? Possession of recently stolen property is another one. So if the Crown alleges that an accused had possession of property that was recently stolen, it is entitled to ask the court to make an inference or draw an inference. And that is in the absence of any rebutting evidence from the accused, that the person's in possession of that stolen property was at least in some way involved in the theft. Now the court doesn't have to draw the conclusion but it is open for the prosecutor to invite the court or the jury, as the case may be, to draw that inference. Again, it's circumstantial, isn't it? That this presumption relating to the possession of recently stolen property is a situation where, as with all presumptions, some evidence is produced, followed by a request for the arbiter of fact to go a little more and draw a further inference based on that existing fact. The accused was found in possession of the crown jewels. Therefore, you might infer that the accused stole the crown jewels. Does that make sense? So it's circumstantial. It's what we call a presumption of fact. Another one that you'll hear about is continuance. So the Oh, and I'm putting all these a little bit in inverted commas because they're not, they're not true presumptions in the same way that presumptions of law are true presumptions. But we do talk about them, so you need to know about it. So continuance. So the presumption of continuance is no more than a recognition of the fact that in ordinary human experience, <clears throat> if a state of affairs existed earlier, then it's likely to have remained in existence later. Does that make sense? So let's take this situation. If a person was seen to leave a hotel in a highly intoxicated state and hop into their car and drive, then if that person was involved in a motor vehicle accident five minutes later, if prosecution or the plaintiff can establish that the driver of the car was intoxicated at the time that he or she got into the car, then the presumption of continuance would suggest that it's open for the arbiter of fact to infer that that person remained drunk at the time of the accident five minutes after leaving the hotel. 
So we're asking them to say, all right, we've proven something. We now want you to presume continuance of that state of affairs to draw an inference that the person must have been drunk at the time of the accident. Okay. All right, does that make sense? All right, thank you. And um, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm talking about methods of proof. So I hope that's, that's okay. Um, so now we move on to a thing called Ray Zipser a locator. A Ray Zipser locator you may come across in torts. And the Australian position is that there may be evidence about an inference of negligence that might be drawn by the arbiter of fact in circumstances where something happens. So, you know, if um, something crashes to the ground on the pavement, causes injury, the presumption is that um, someone upstairs was negligent because this piece of bulky equipment should not have escaped, to use the term, the third floor. I mean, how did the piano land on the pavement and cause injury unless somebody upstairs was negligent and allowed that event to occur? Does that make sense? So again, it's a, it's a presumption of fact. It's an inference that we may wish to draw. So they're presumptions of fact, which are really circumstantial evidence. What about presumptions of law? Now, they might be rebuttable or they may be irrebuttable. So does anyone know any rebuttable presumptions of law? Do you know what I mean by rebuttable as opposed to irre irrebuttable presumptions? Maybe I should start with that question. Yes, Tegan. Is, is that like the innocent until proven guilty? Is that? Yeah, I guess I hadn't thought about that specifically, but it's a, that's certainly along those lines. Yeah, so the, yes, so the presumption at law is that an accused is innocent. Um, but it is rebuttable in the sense that prosecution may bring enough evidence to overcome that initial presumption. Yeah, that works. Yeah, thank you, Tegan. That's good. Anything else? Any other examples? But that's certainly along the right lines. So let's have a look at rebuttable presumptions of law. So where there is an obligation on a court to draw certain conclusions then that is irrebuttable. But if the court can choose to draw the further inference or not, then that is a rebuttable presumption of law. Have a look at the Evidence Act, Queensland, Section 62. There is a presumption that documents 20 years old, um, they're presumed to have been validly executed on the date that it bears. I mean, it's just a convenience thing. It's rebuttable, so the other side can bring proof to uh, negate it. But if we're discussing a contract that was signed in 1962, the law says, look, it's practically very difficult to bring evidence to a court to prove the signatures and to prove that it was validly executed on the date that it, it bears. So we're going to accept, unless the other side bring evidence to the contrary, there is a presumption that the document it was in fact signed on the 2nd of July 1962 because that's what it says on it. There are some other presumptions in the criminal law sphere. Um, there's a presumption of lack of criminal capacity for a person aged under 14 years. So if you have a 13 year old and you're defending a 13 year old accused of, of a crime, the first thing you should consider is whether your client actually had the capacity to know that what he or she did, allegedly, was wrong. Now, the presumption of lack of criminal capacity applies, and um, that, that can be overcome through evidence, but that's the starting point. Another very common one is a presumption about the involuntariness, involuntariness, if I can use that term, of a confession following a threat or an inducement. Has anyone come across that in their reading? So if someone confesses to a crime and says, I was threatened or induced 
to make that confession, the law creates a presumption. Is so that, the, is yes, that around police powers? Is Very good. Yes. yes. Police power. Yep. Um, so what I'd like you to do, though, is have a look at Section 10 of the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 1894. And that act says, or that section says, that no confession, which is tendered in evidence on criminal proceedings, shall be received, which has been induced by a threat or promise by some person in authority. And every confession made after a threat or a promise shall be deemed to have been induced unless the contrary is shown. So it's very common for people in authority to seek to confirm with the person who made the confession that they did not do so as a result of any threat or promise. You'll hear that in police interviews. All right, well, you've now confessed to the crime. Um, are you prepared to say that you were not induced by any threat or promise made by me or any other person in authority? Does that make sense? Okay, so again, it doesn't, it doesn't automatically apply, but the law says we're going to presume that if there was a threat, if there was a promise made, and the person confessed as a result of that threat or that promise, then they did not do so voluntarily. Okay, Section 10 of the Criminal Law Amendment Act. There's another one in relation to the presumption of sanity. I mean, it's not real. It's, have a look at Section 26 of the Criminal Code. Um, basically, the presumption is that people are sane. I mean, it's a little bit like the work that I do in the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal, and also the Mental Health Review Tribunal, where the starting point when dealing with the capacity of an adult to make decisions is that they are capable of making the decisions. So that's the starting point, and the tribunal would consider evidence that might rebut that presumption about the adult having capacity. Same sort of thing in Section 29 of the Criminal Code, uh, sorry, Section 26 of the Criminal Code, where there is a presumption of capacity. Okay, I mentioned Section 29. Section 29 of the Code is actually um, an irrebuttable presumption of law, and that is a presumption that a person who is under the age of 10 years is not criminally responsible for any act. So that is irrebuttable. So if you're defending a person who is nine years of age, brought before the criminal court, it's a pretty easy win, isn't it? If you can establish that person's age, then the court has no alternative. As a matter of law, must dismiss the charge on the basis that that person is irrebuttably presumed not to be criminally responsible for any act or omission. Now, does that all make sense? I think there's a couple of... All right, Samantha, you um, had a question in relation to offences about capacity or thereof. That was a little while ago, I think. Did you want to follow through on that? Or have we um, dealt with that? No, that's okay. You answered it then. I was just okay. a bit confused because I did think it was under 10. Oh, yes, yes. So I had them mixed up. Right, yeah, actually, I saw you nod when I said that. So under 10, irrebuttable, under 14. The presumption is no, but prosecution can rebut that evidence. Okay, now, so that's, that's one of the four that we were talking about tonight. The second one, judicial notice. So we talked briefly about judicial notice. I gave an example of it. So what it means is this. If a court judicially notes something, it means it's prepared to accept it on the basis that it's common knowledge, it's generally known, it's notoriously known, is, is some of the wording I use. Have a look at the Evidence Act, Commonwealth, Section 144. In the Commonwealth Evidence Act, it outlines matters of common knowledge and it provides in the legislation, as opposed to the common law, that proof is not required about knowledge where it's reasonably open um, to know that and the judge may acquire the knowledge in any way that it sees fit and the court 
and, and even a jury is to take uh, knowledge of that type into account. I mean, for example, um, if you've got a if you've got a case in the district court in Brisbane about an alleged assault at the Queen Street Queen Street Mall, I think we all know where the Queen Street Mall is. You know, you don't have to to bring in someone to say this is the address and the, the coordinates of the Queen Street Mall and it's bordered by these streets, etc. I mean, you can if you like, but if somebody says, look, I was in the Queen Street Mall, you don't object and say, objection, nobody's established where the Queen Street Mall is. Do you, do you know what I mean? Everybody knows it. So that's um, where the court can take judicial notice without making any inquiry. Sometimes the court can take judicial notice after they make inquiry. In other words, on some occasions, the court will feel entitled to take judicial notice of something, but only after it's done some research. You might think, now that's really odd. How can the court go and independently undertake some research? Isn't all of that supposed to be produced at the trial? I think you're right, but I think it's, um, again, I'll use the word notorious. So even though someone may not know the answer, therefore cannot specifically, without inquiry, take judicial notice of the answer, the fact is that there is an answer and the answer to the question will be incontrovertible. So it will be incontrovertible, but not necessarily instantly or already known for everyone. I mean, let's take an example. The average temperature of the human body. I mean, there will be an answer to that. I don't know. What is it? Is it 90, I don't know, 96? I don't know. Something. That, whatever the answer is. Vivian, do you know? Yes, it's um, between 36.8 <laughs> degrees Celsius to, to 37.4 degrees Celsius. Very good. Well, I hope that bears some relationship to 96. Maybe that's Fahrenheit. I don't know. <laughs> yes, Fahrenheit. Yeah, not, yeah 96 degrees <laughs> Fahrenheit. Okay. Very good. So whatever it is. So thank you, Vivian, for that You're contribution. Yeah. So, you know, the point is that the judge may not know that, but can just have a quick look. Um, so that's judicial notice with inquiry, but used very carefully. Now, sometimes there's judicial notice under statute. Can anyone tell me a relevant section under the Evidence Act in Queensland that deals with the issue of judicial notice under statute? Section 65. Very good. And I think I've got a feeling, Tegan, that you just beat Samantha to the answer on that one. So thank you, Tegan. Spot on. What does Section 65 deal with? Distance between places, territorial limits. So in those, very good. So in that instance, the court is entitled to admit into evidence a published book or a map or a chart or a document that appears to be to the court to be reliable for the source of information in relation to the question. What's the distance between the GPO in Brisbane and the GPO at Ipswich? Do we really have to bring in someone to say that they've measured the distance or they've driven it or something else? We can have a look at a map, can't we? So that's covered by section 65. All right, so that's judicial notice. Any questions about that? You're doing well, you're doing well. you've been very patient. Let's um, have a look at formal admissions a bit more. I mean, what is the point of formally admitting something? If you're the defendant in a civil matter and the plaintiff says, there was a motor vehicle accident, it was on this day, it was at this location, and I, the plaintiff, was driving my car, which is a Mazda 6. I mean, as the defendant, would you say, prove all that, prove everything? Or would you say, I'll admit certain things? What do you think? Why wouldn't you admit it? I reckon that's a good response. Why, why wouldn't you admit that? Mm. Yep. Has anyone else got any thoughts? Has anyone got the contrary view? No, make them, make them prove everything. 
some lawyers, I think, adopt an attitude of let them prove everything. My personal view is no, make formal admissions where it's appropriate and sensible to do so. A couple of reasons for that. The first is that if you make a sensible concession or a, concession, a sensible admission, you are saving the court time and you're saving the client time and money. Second reason is that you're leaving more time to deal with the real issues. We all know that it was Smith Street. We all know that it was 5 to 11 when the accident occurred. We know that you were driving a Mazda 6. And f look, please admit that we were driving a, you know, a Volvo or whatever. Um, but the real argument is about whether you were speeding and whether you went through a, a stop sign and that's what caused the accident. That's the important stuff. So I think for a couple of reasons, it is important to consider making formal admissions. So when we talk about admissions, we're really talking about civil cases. And um, that's where you would find, uh, you would find the admissions normally in pleadings. Have you come across pleadings? Do you know what I mean by pleadings? Right, so in a, in a civil case, there's a series of documents that basically set out the parameters of the case, set out the basic facts, the important facts, the, the material facts, and if in the pleading, the plaintiff says one, two, three, four, you know, building a narrative, building a story about what happened, the defendant in the defence might say, I formally admit paragraphs one, two, three, and four. Paragraph five, not so much. Do you understand? So in the pleadings, we will often see those formal admissions, but that only applies in relation to civil cases. Another way of doing that is to submit a notice to admit certain facts on the other side. And if the other side won't admit things and they force you to prove it, it may have a consequence on in costs. Have a look at the Uniform Civil Procedure Rules, uh, rule number 189 in that regard. Okay, so um, in a civil trial, it's quite common at the start of the trial for counsel, for either or both, to make formal admissions in open court and that becomes part of the findings of the, of the court, findings of fact in the court. Now in criminal cases, um, you can have admissions, they're, they're really concessions, but um, uh, the admissions are referred to in section 644 of the criminal code in Queensland. This is all relevant to evidence law, of course, in that these are the basic ways of proving simple matters without having to actually adduce evidence to do so. But the next one is estoppel. Um, we talked about estoppel. Um, estoppel applies on a couple of conditions. The first is it needs to be between the same parties litigating the same matter in the same legal capacity as was previously the case. So I mentioned, you know, you've got two parties arguing about the same factual circumstances, the matter's determined, then one of them says, oh, I sued on contract, I should have sued on tort. That's when the Anshan estoppel comes in. So there are basically two types of estoppel. One is cause of action estoppel, which is some Latin here, res judicata, which is the entire action. Second type of estoppel is more limited, and it's what we call issue estoppel. Now, it is possible to have cause of action estoppel in criminal cases, and it is um, possible to have issue estoppel in criminal cases as well. I'll just mention those things briefly. So cause of action estoppel, essentially saying the entire case litigated between the parties is no longer the subject of further proceedings. What do we, I mean, what do we commonly, what do we commonly call that? So if someone brings a charge of murder against a, a person, a prosecutor brings a charge of murder, the case is litigated, the defendant is acquitted, and later, there's some new evidence comes to light, prosecutor recharges with murder. 
I mean, there are some exceptions now under the, under the law, but ba the basic rule is this, isn't it? Isn't it called the double jeopardy rule? Have you heard of that? Wasn't there a movie with Ashley Judd called Samantha saying, yes, I've seen that um, movie. What, that was the one saying you can walk down the street and, you know, you've already been convicted of murder. So you can just murder him for real this time. <laughs> It was a good movie. Um, so have a look at um, uh, a couple of cases and then consider section 17 of the criminal code, which was, be, which was amended. So the, the cases that I'm going to refer you to are R against L Zwar, that's E-L, new word, Z-A-R-W. It was 1994 to QDR 67. In that case, the defendant was acquitted of murder. He basically said on oath an alibi that uh, he was, um, you know, not, it was not possible that he could have committed the murder. Um, one of his friends confessed the alibi was perjury and the Crown brought perjury proceedings against the defendant on the basis that he fal falsely stated in the witness box that he had not murdered his wife, in fact, when he had done, and the criminal court of the Queensland Criminal Court of Appeal held that the Crown could not bring that action on the grounds of abusive process and double jeopardy. So even though it wasn't exactly the same thing, the Crown weren't charging him with murder again. He'd already been acquitted of that. They said, let's charge him with perjury because he lied in the witness box in order to assist in securing his acquittal. In that case, back in 1994, the Court of Appeal said, no, that's an abusive process. It's double jeopardy. We're covering the old ground. You can't do it. R.V. Carroll, 2002-213-CLR-635. That's Carroll. From 2002, the citation is 213-CLR, Commonwealth Law Report 635. The High Court confirmed the principle. Carroll was charged with perjury. Crown argued for an exemption to the prohibition against double jeopardy because of new evidence. That acquittal was obtained essentially by fraud. The High Court rejected the Crown argument. So again, we have that consistency between the two cases that I've mentioned in the Court of Appeal and the High Court. So what did the government do? Section 17 was amended in the Criminal Code to permit the previous double jeopardy rule to be sidestepped in future situations to allow a retrial on a murder charge if there is a tainted acquittal. Okay, so that's criminal law. In uh, criminal law, there is also the issue of, uh, sorry, there is also issue estoppel. And um, the uh, case there is Rogers against the Queen, 1994, 181 CLR, and in that case, there was a trial. The jury was hung. You know what I mean by hung jury? Okay, not, not uh, consensus. There was a fresh trial and evidence related to the matters where the um, jury acquitted the defendant uh, may be presented to the jury in the second trial with a proper warning. Um, the evidence can be admitted if it goes towards proving another charge in the new case. So even though there was this earlier case, the hung jury, second trial, um, in certain circumstances, the material that was raised in the first trial can be raised again. I won't go into that in any more detail than that. All right, so then there's the whole issue of uh, cause of action estoppel in civil cases. And um, I'll mention just the one case. I've mentioned it briefly already. This is um, the important decision of Port of Melbourne Authority against Anne Shun, PTYLTD. It's 1981 147 CLR at 589. And there was an apportion of liability in a negligence case. A dockyard worker had been injured. Um, it was the negligent operation of a, uh, operation of a crane. And um, they used this crane on hire from another company. So in the new action, the Port of Melbourne Authority um, brought 
to sought on, to sought to enforce a clause in the hire contract against Ansham to make them fully liable for um, the uh, actions arising from the use of the crane. Now the court said, look, you could have raised that and should have raised that when we litigated this for the first time. Um, they said that the new claim was so closely associated with the subject matter of the first case that one would have expected it to be raised and relied upon at that time. So we're not going to allow it now. Okay, so that's Anne Shana Stoppel. Um, all right, so any questions so far? I'm very conscious that time is getting away from us and I, I did want to cover some other material as well. So I'll just move selectively through what I had in mind. All right, let's now look at more the types and classification of evidence. So evidence can be classified in different ways. There are different types of evidence. This is more in line directly with your reading. So what type of evidence can be presented to a court? Yes, Vivian? Documentary evidence. Yes, great. There are two other types of evidence that can be presented to a court, which is at that level of the type of evidence. Yes, Tig? Oral and real evidence. Very good. Okay, so oral evidence, documentary evidence, and real evidence. Now, we know what they mean, don't we? Oral, me talking. Documentary, here's a document. Real evidence, here's the knife. Okay, so that's one way of classifying evidence. But see, there's different ways of classifying evidence as well. Different types of evidence. Can you think of anything else? You've got to be a mind reader here to think about what I'm considering. Oral evidence might be direct. If it's not direct, what would it be? Hearsay. Not the answer I'm looking for, but indirect. very good. Indirect. What's another word for indirect? I've used it a few times tonight. I used it in the context of talking about a presumption of fact, saying that a presumption of fact is really nothing more than what type of evidence starting with C. Give up. Circumstantial. Yeah. Okay. So direct evidence is, this is exactly what I saw. It goes directly to the heart of the matter. Circumstantial is, this is what I saw, but you will need to draw an inference, a circumstantial inference. It's not direct in the sense of proving something immediately. So that's a different way of categorizing evidence, isn't it? And there's another one, primary or secondary evidence. So oral evidence is given by a witness in court. The witness is not giving evidence about opinion typically. When giving oral evidence, the witness is encouraged to give evidence about what they saw, what they heard, what they smelt, what they touched, you know, using their five senses. Sometimes, in fact, the person giving oral evidence doesn't actually have to be in the court. Or if they're in the court, they might be protected in some way. It might be a privacy screen, for example. Sometimes the evidence is given remotely by video conference, often for professional witnesses, doctors, etc. Other times, the evidence is given remotely and not at the time of the main part of the trial. So it might be what we call pre-recorded evidence of a complainant child witness. But that's all oral evidence. So whether it's presented in court, in person, or by video link, or it's presented, um, or it's pre-recorded, 
it's still oral evidence. Documentary evidence, I think we know that there's a wide range of things that might be considered as a document. If I asked you to consider whether a photograph is a document or not, of course you will say, yes it is. Photograph is a document under our evidence law in Queensland. But if the judge said to you, well, what's your authority for that statement? Why should I accept a photograph as a document? What would you say? Queensland case? Any thoughts? We're scurrying hard. Now you're all looking at the Evidence Act, of course, aren't you? The Queensland Evidence Act, 1977. All right, time's up. Schedule three. Have a look at schedule three and it defines document. Now, a document can become an item of evidence in a different number of different ways. It might be real evidence. It, um, let's say, um, like, I know Anthony Marinak talks about this in his lectures and he's right. Um, a shirt, for example, you would think that that is real evidence. It's a shirt. It's not a document, but it can be a document. Um, if what you're looking to do with that shirt is establish something that is written on it. Okay, the example that Anthony uses in his recording is, you know, if someone's wearing a shirt, FTP. We all know what that means, don't we? Um, if you're trying to establish those words and what they mean in the context of the case, that's using the shirt as a document because we're looking to establish, we're looking at the meaning of the words on that shirt. If we're just identifying the shirt as being the shirt that was used by the person who was um, assaulted, then it's, it's purely a matter of real evidence. I hope that makes some sense. Okay. Um, but documents can be evidence of legal transactions. For example, a certificate of title is evidence that someone owns property, doesn't it? If a person was found with a, an ATM slip near the scene of a crime um, and, uh, and that slip was, say, near the ATM, it might be used as evidence of withdrawal of money from that ATM. So it can be used as real evidence, a document can be used as real evidence, or it can be used as evidence for proving something contained within that document for to, to establish the proof of it. Now I know I'm moving quite quickly because time is getting away. In the common law sphere, have a look at sections 48 and 51 of the Evidence Act. In terms of the proof of contents of documents and the original document rule abolished. Has anyone come across a thing called the parole evidence rule? Parole, P-A-R-O-L-E, evidence rule. This is, this is quite important because it sets up a little a bit of a presumption. So basically the parole evidence rule is this, that a party cannot seek to amend or vary or contradict what appears to be the clear terms of a contract by means of oral evidence. Now that rule is subject to so many exceptions and qualifications that in practice it's lost a lot of its original effect. But you will hear that from time to time, the parole evidence rule. Another thing you might come across is what we call the best evidence rule. It's less relevant now than it was, but the best evidence rule was, look, um, don't give me a photocopy, I want the original type deal. Uh, that's been watered down, um, you know, considerably. So there was a case of Godfrey against Woolworths 
and a magistrate refused to accept evidence about weights and measures, like an inspector had undertaken a search of frozen fish, packets of frozen fish. Came to court and attempted to prosecute Woolworths on the basis that having tested the frozen uh, fish packets, they were underweight and therefore wanted the magistrate to convict Woolworths. Um, what happened is that the inspector recorded the weights on a sheet, attempted to use that as evidence, and the magistrate said, no, don't give me that. Give me the best evidence. Give me the packets of frozen fish. <laughs> now, not unreasonably, the inspector said, well, they're long gone. Um, you know, it's just not, I can't tender that evidence for you. Uh, the Supreme Court, uh, Court overruled the decision and basically said it was unrealistic to expect that the inspector would keep the frozen fish packets for more than a year after the event solely to produce them as evidence at the trial. So that best evidence rule has been watered down a bit. All right, so um, real evidence, and I, I won't go on for much longer because I actually did intend to look at the um, weekly questions and I know Vivian you've been answering the questions so thank you very much for that um, and I will briefly talk about them but um, you'll need to understand from the material views and demonstrations and reconstructions so in that regard have a look at the Commonwealth Evidence Act section 53 regarding views and um, if there's an application to do so the court can order a demonstration or an experiment or an inspection. But they won't do that unless satisfied that the parties are given a reasonable opportunity um, in relation to that issue. So um, demonstration views and reconstructions are sometimes used, but you'll need to make application in that regard. Now, sometimes there is um, the opportunity to reject evidence on the basis that it is um, unreasonable, unfair for it to be produced. So just as something to keep in mind pretty much always in the Queensland sphere, and you notice I'm bouncing between Queensland and Commonwealth, and that's a big hint to go to either the Queensland Evidence Act or the Commonwealth Evidence Act, as the case may be. Queensland in terms of rejection of evidence on the basis that it is unfair for it to be presented, keep in mind section 130, 130 of the Act, the Evidence Act, because it basically says that there's nothing um, in the Act which derogates from the power of a court to exclude evidence if the court is satisfied it would be unfair to the person charged to admit that evidence. So it goes to the general um, fairness rule. All right, I'm going to leave it at that in terms of general material. There's a whole lot more in your textbook. Um, Shepherd's case, Christie, discretion, um, but I'll leave you to read that for yourself. I just want to talk about some of the uh, problems and a reminder that it is very good practice to complete answers to the problems. Vivian, thank you for doing so. Vivian, what did you think of Aaron, the movie Erin Brockovich and um, Samantha and Tegan? Have you seen it, that movie? Yeah, I've seen the, I've seen the movie before some years back, and um, yes, yeah, quite. Um, I think they try to depict some of the real dangers in in the, in the real world. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so, what type of evidence can you? you say was used or presented in that case? Oh, definitely documents. Documents, yes. Yeah. Documentary evidence, yes. Anything else? Oral evidence, of course. And the oral evidence, and, and Vivian provided a good response. Um, her testimony, which was oral evidence. Um, but there was some ev uh, opinion evidence and a bit of hearsay evidence as well, a bit of expert evidence also. Okay.
Um, and of course, there are rules that relate to the admissibility of those things. So the next question was um, in relation to if you were opposing the, the applica application or the, the claim, what evidence would have most concerned you? And in the question, you're asked to consider the testimony from litigants describing the medical issues, persuasive demonstrations, evidence from scientific experts, evidence relating to medical conditions experienced by those exposed to the contamination, and evidence of internal memos indicating the company was aware of the potential harm but did nothing to correct it. Now, Vivian, can you remember what you wrote as your answer? What would yes, be most? I, I selected, I said the, the, um, the most, um, the, the, the one that is the, 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 the one about the internal memos. Option five. Option five, proving that the company knew about the harmful effects of that substance and they refused to do anything about it. Yes. And I think, I think there's a, an argument to say any one of those five could be the most damning. But I tend to agree with you, Vivian, that number five, the internal memos, was like a smoking gun, wasn't it? It yes. was like an admission and a concealment rolled up in yes. one. So a jury hearing about that, it was a bit like the tobacco matters, wasn't it? Um, yeah, yes. Would be concerned about that. So, so just to interrupt, from memory, didn't she um, try and get one of them to drink some of the water or something as well? So would that be a demonstration? How would that be? How yep. would that be classified? It it would be a demonstration, and you're right. The um, I think the attorney is given a glass of water from the allegedly contaminated site to drink. That would be a demonstration. Absolutely. Would you drink it? <laughs> no, you'd be brave. All right, so thank you for that. All right, the third question, and we're almost finished for this evening, you're doing well. If you represented the um, other side and had to, to find ways to weaken Erin Brockovich's case, how would you do it? What would you focus upon? Vivian, can you recall your answer? Yes, my... Um I still said that if I can raise a rebuttal against the, the fact of the internal memos, because that's what's going to nail the case. So if, yes, if I can, yeah, just, if I can just inject a modicum of doubt into that. Yes. And that's right. Although being a civil case, we probably need a bit more than a modicum of doubt, okay, but so. you're on the right track. Absolutely. So take the um, most potent evidence against you and try to work on rebutting that because it's the most harmful uh, material. And bringing in scientific evidence to rebut that type of evidence is always the strongest way, I think, to do that. So just as an aside, what's the test for a plaintiff in a civil case? What's the test? What's the standard of proof? On the balance of probability. On the balance of probability. Balance yes. of probability is good. And how does the Brigginshaw test or the Brigginshaw standard affect that? Is it on the value? So it needs to be at a higher standard if the, the loss or the, the gain is at a higher level? Yeah, that's a long, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. Sort of? <laughs> yeah, no, that's it. Um, so the, 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 it's still 50, it's still on the balance of probabilities, but Brigginshaw says that the greater the consequence, the more um, potent the quality of the evidence that needs to be to satisfy the court, uh, even though it is still on that 50-50 test. I hope that makes sense. All right, so question six was the last one for tonight. It dealt with the issue of competence and compelability. And the question asked you to comment upon comments made by um, Premier in terms of removing the right to silence for those charged with criminal offences. So I think there's arguments for and against this. Vivian, can you remember your response and do you wish to speak to that? Okay, so arguments for, um, for um, changing the law. Um, some people, some 
crim criminal suspects have taken advantage of that and the actual victims have lost the battle, have lost the, um, the, 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 their cases in court where the reverse should have been the case. So, so that's one of my, so that's to, 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 to reduce the criminals from, ex, from appearing innocent. Okay. And then against that majority, the, the, the innocent majority in the society tend to suffer, in the public tend to suffer because of the few criminals who are being targeted. Yes, very good. Okay, thank you very much, Vivian, for those yes. observations and good response. Tegan or Samantha, do you wish to add anything to that discussion? All good? Okay. All right, well, thank you for your patience. I know there's a lot of reading in this unit, but uh, generally, how are you coping with the reading? You doing okay? Good. Keep at, keep at it. Yeah, I I got stuck on one um, one case that you referred to where it was in South Australia. Um, Fennec. Mm, yes. Yes, Fennec's yes. tart. We'll be talking oh. about more about Fennec uh, in the context of similar fact evidence later in the unit. It but was it is, um, a fantastic tough. case. Yes, um, yes, <laughs> it is. It's interesting. Really, really, really good. So um, I recommend um, anyone else reading it. And there's a follow-up too around the um, around the case because he has been uh, charged and found guilty of the case in South Australia um, of the other child, Louise Bell. So it's really, yeah. really good stuff. So Fenning, and that's with a PH. So PH. Yeah. Uh, a in, PF. In, P -F, sorry, P -F. Yep. P -F -E -N -N -I, -G, I think is the spelling. So yep. Fenning. Okay, very good. Thank you, Samantha, for that observation. All right, well, we'll end the session for tonight. Thank you very much for attending. Um, again, just a reminder, for those watching this as a recorded session, please let me know who your partner is going to be for the first assessment and think about joining us live next Wednesday. All the best. We'll see you next time. Bye.